Is it hard to be a Mormon sometimes, especially with all those anti-Mormon lies that Christians and apostates spread? Today's video is going to be on the nine top myths of Mormonism and the lies spread by anti-Mormon Christians and apostates. So let's get right into it. Number one, saints, Mormons are not Christians. They worship a different Jesus whose brother is Lucifer and believe they can become gods and have their own planet. Are you tired of hearing these kind of things from Christians and would you like to be able to refute them right from LDS history or scriptures? Well, let's start off. Mormons are not Christians, they say. Well, that's absurd. What's the name of the church? Duh! It's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Christians, learn how to read! Okay, some Christians might think that that's a problem that you worship a different Jesus, and that the name of the church isn't that big of a deal. I mean, they're named Baptists, and they don't follow John the Baptist, do they? Then again, Mormons, well, we haven't always been called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's the Church of the New Name. It's on the third name right now. Many Latter-day Saints don't know that, but the church was originally formed in 1830 by Joseph Smith and five other individuals. This was done on April 6th, and the church that they formed was actually called the Church of Christ. So still, duh, Christians, it's still named after Christ. Now there was a little hiccup. Around 1834, the church, well, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon apparently changed the name for some reason. Maybe because they found out that the Church of Christ was a name that was already taken a few years back in Kentucky. You know how those fictitious business name things work with business. I mean, maybe they couldn't even get the name license for the whole country or something. I really don't know, but they did change the name. What's the big deal? They kept Jesus' name in it, didn't they? Oh, you're right, they didn't. It became the Church of the Latter-day Saints. But that was only for four years. Because I think they <clears throat> remembered what it said in the Book of Mormon, that Jesus said, how be it my church, save it be called in my name. For be it, if it's called in John's name, then it's John's church. If it's called in Moses' name, then it's M Moses' church. But if it's called in my name, then it's my church, if it so be that they are built upon my gospel. Of course, they are building upon his gospel. They just forgot to put his name in it for four years. But they fixed it up and made it the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So there. We're back to Jesus, finally. It only took four years, and hey, we've, for, we've, we've repented of that, Christians. So don't be talking about that. Some of you are still named Baptist or Presbyterian. Do you, are, are you the Church of Presbyterian? Come on. Okay. Oh yeah, you don't follow the Book of Mormon, so maybe that doesn't matter. Okay, next. Worship a different Jesus, whose brother is Lucifer. Okay. So what if his brother's Lucifer? What's your problem with that? Well, I've read what some Christians say, and they say, how horrible is that to be associated with Lucifer? But in Christianity, didn't God create Lucifer and send him down the earth to the earth to torment us all and lead us astray? Well, if he's the parent doing it, then that sounds pretty much like it's his fault not Jesus' fault. So, I don't know why that argument even stands up. Come on, Christians. Are you thinking about what your religion says? Okay, whose, whose brother is Lucifer, and they believe that they can become gods and own their own planet. Okay. You know, it's sometimes it's kind of like some people's wives tell them, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. And it's how you said it in movies, or how you said it in cartoons, like the God Makers, or how you said it on Broadway, like in, you know, the Book of Mormon musical. They're making fun of people for knowing that they can become gods. What's wrong with becoming a god and having your own planet? Let's be, let, let, let's be candid here. I know of no LDS scripture that says you get your own planet. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself is still on the waiting list. He gets to come to this earth and possess it in the millennium, we're told. If he hasn't gotten there, 
who knows when you and I can. Now, becoming gods, yeah. Well, that's pretty standard LDS doctrine. It's taught in section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It says things like, then shall they be gods, for they have no end. Then shall they be gods, for all things are subject unto them. It also says that Abraham has actually entered into his exaltation and is a god. So, yeah, we believe in becoming gods. What's your problem? You know, you want to play a harp on a cloud. We want to be a god. You tell me what's better. All right, maybe we can get to the next thing. Number two. Mormons are part of a cult, like the Moonies, the Scientologists, or the Jehovah Witnesses, or SDA, meaning Seventh-day Adventists. Hey, come on. Do you really think we're like those people? And J-Dubs? They're not that bad, are they? And SDA? Hey, listen. Those guys make the Big Frank. You know, Loma Linda's soy hot dogs? Those things were practically a religion in my family. They sure be Deseret turkey chunks. I'll tell you that right now. So, I have nothing bad to say about the Loma Linda meat alternatives. After all, the, 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 the uh, Seventh-day Adventists actually live their own word of wisdom a little better than the Mormons do. But let's not get on Mormon's case. This is about defending Mormonism, isn't it? Okay, part of a cult like the Moonies. Well, the word cult if we look at the dictionary, basically all religions qualify as cults. Any organized religion is a cult, okay? Look up the definition in the dictionary. I've done that on dictionary.com and straighten people out. Yes, Christianity is a cult. But when we say the word cult, we think of something a little bit more extreme than maybe your average, everyday, mm, practicing evangelical Christian, possibly. We think of groups like, um, you know, Heaven's Gate, who uh, tried to get on a spaceship by committing suicide in Rancho Santa Fe, California a few years ago. But then again, they followed, Lor was it Lawrence Applegate? And that guy just wasn't, you know, he wasn't based on anything factual. He told those people they should just believe in him by praying in their closets and not listening to what other people had to say. Don't look at the facts, he said. Just feel good about it. Well, that's the kind of thing that maybe Jim Jones did when he led his people off to, uh, was it Guyana? And they all committed suicide. You've heard of the James Jonestown Kool-Aid, haven't you? Don't drink the Kool-Aid. So Mormons aren't drinking that kind of Kool-Aid, are they? Moonies? Hmm, aren't those guys like trying to send you like, uh, mm, I don't know, tainted tofu on the street corner wearing Arabian style clothing or something weird don't they all live in a cult-like community they're pretty weird those guys actually look like they're mind controlled well how about Scientologists hey some popular people are in that was it Kevin Cosner no not him I don't know one of those same famous guys I'm really not into it but they do have kind of like uh, oh, compounds and maybe they make their people who disobey them, like scrub the floor with their toothbrush in their mouth or something, or lick the toilet or some, who knows what they do. They do some pretty weird stuff. Mormons aren't like that. How about Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, what, what's in common with these people? What do they practice? You know, we've got Steve Hassan, who's, who's really an, an expert in, in, in cult mind control, and he actually, actually, was part of the Moonies for a while, but he got out. And he tells us that we can recognize some things. So all we gotta do is recognize these. We can see, you know, if these things apply in these groups and see if they apply to Mormonism. What's the bite model that he used in, in cult mind control? Well, in other words, for mind control, which is not brainwashing, if you know your terminology, mind control is used a lot. It's, it's used by large organizations. It's actually used in group mind control in the media. What does mind control do? And what does it do in a cult organization? Well, how about behavioral control? How about information control? How about thought control? And then how about emotional control? All right, 
behavioral control. Well, if you're locked into a compound and they tell you when you get up, when to go down, what, what you do, what you, you know, that's behavioral control. But what about telling you things like the Jehovah's Witnesses do? Like they have to have like short hair and, and they can't have like tattoos or excessive earrings or, you know, they've got like a dress code. Okay? They've got some health code. Well, SDA's got a health code, I know that. But hey, it's good for you. Okay, Mormons have the word of wisdom. But you don't want to become a slave to drinking. What if you became an alcoholic? I mean, it's just a revelation from God, right? Although, I guess it does say that mild drinks of barley are approved. It also says it wasn't given by way of commandment. And we know that Joseph Smith drank until the day he died, and Brigham Young not only drank, but he was in the liquor business. In fact, he organized <clears throat> LDS tithing houses and had uh, grape vineyards planted in southern Utah, and the, the saints either made their own wine to sell to the uh, people in mining operations and other things going on in southern Utah, you know, Gentiles. Or they actually took the grapes to the bishop's storehouse and the church made the wine. But they were going to sell it to the Gentiles, right? Okay, so they stopped. It got to be a problem. Too many of the saints were drinking too much of the wine. So it wasn't a commandment anyway. Read it. It says it's not a commandment. It became policy much later but was never given as a commandment. Although it does say that it's given, you know, adapted to the weak and the weakest of those that can be called saints. So, okay, it's a little confusing. So, telling you what you can eat, what you can drink, what you can wear, how to wear your hair. Can you wear purple hair, blue hair, green hair? You know, those kind of things. All right, Mormons do a little bit of that. But JWs do it. Oh, yeah, okay. They're part of this thing. I guess Christians think they're a cult. So they, they tell you what you can do. These create submissiveness. But okay, you got a little bit of that. But what about, what about information control? The Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, they kind of got their own Bible and they don't just read straight out of the Bible. They've got the watchtower. So they've got these theme-based lessons. And yeah, they bring in a scripture here and a scripture there. And they study in these group studies, you know, kind of like Sunday school. And the teacher's manual kind of tells them what the expected answer is supposed to be. Of course, if you don't give the right answer, you might be kind of pressured or made to look stupid, you know, or like you're rejecting their, their prophets. Oh, did we get into the prophets thing? Maybe we'll get off of that just for a moment. So they got information control. They actually tell people, don't look on the internet, it's evil. You know, they're like afraid they'll see something that'll contradict the Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine or prove it from the scriptures that, you know, that's contradicting. So they say, don't get on the Internet. It's all evil. It's of the devil. As a matter of fact, when people leave the church, this is part of information control and part of behavioral control. They're called apostates. Jehovah's Witnesses call them apostates too. Yeah, OK. They're, and they, I actually listened to this thing in, in like their general conference. God gave them a revelation to have a general conference, I guess, too. Actually, he probably didn't. It's part of being a, you know, 501c3 corporation. It's got nothing to do with uh, God. <clears throat> it's a corporate thing for their tax-exempt status. Anyway, in their, like, general conference or one of their big conferences, you know, I saw it, like, on a video. They said, you mustn't associate with apostates. They are a disease. They want to infect you. It's Satan. I mean, if they think they've got the Holy Ghost, which they think they do, they, they have the one true church, they, they say, you know. We're the one true church, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower. Yeah, that's what they say, but they call it in the truth. If you're Mormon, you kind of have your own lingo. It's called the restored gospel. Well, the J-dubs, they call it in the truth. So they're in the truth, and if you're out of the truth, you're gone. Now... <sighs> Okay, so that controls information. And they say, you want safety? Go to JW.org. We've got the right information from you. You don't need to look outside. Now, Mormon apostles and prophets have told us, hey, the church can bear up to scrutiny. It bears examination. J. Reuben Clark, Jr., he was a senior. 
you know, he said, he said that. He said basically the same, same kind of thing Gordon B. Hinckley said. He said, look, either the first vision's true or we're a huge fake. Either the, either the Book of Mormon's true or we're a huge fake. Check it out. Look in the light. If someone's got something to say that's not true, compare it and determine it. You've got the gift of the Holy Ghost. It helps you discern. You can think these things through. Right? Isn't that what they say? Well, I suppose we can take a look on LDS.org and see if they use scare tactics for information control or not. They don't say, don't read apostate literature, do they? Don't, because the devil will suck you in. No, they don't say that, do they? They say, compare it. See what these ex-Mormons or, or, or Christians have to say and read your scriptures and compare it. Look at our history. It's an open book. Isn't that what Gordon Mangley said? Our history is an open book? So, let's look at it. Let's see if it's consistent with being led by an all-powerful, all-knowing, unchanging God. From everlasting to everlasting. From all eternity to all eternity. Yeah, that's what we're taught in the Book of Mormon. So, it must be true. Alrighty. Part of a cult. Give me a break. Okay, what, what else do they use in the bite model? What's T stand for? T, thought control. Reminds me of uh, Pink Floyd. Uh, they're just talking about the government. <sighs> Teacher, leave those kids alone. We don't need, we don't need no thought control, no. Okay, so how does thought control work? Well, that's part of, that's kind of like information control, isn't it? Isn't it? Can you think of how Jehovah's Witnesses practice thought control on their people or how the Moonies do it, you know? Are they taught to shut down thoughts of critical thinking, rational thinking when they contradict their belief system? To just like bear their testimony if they get into a discussion where, you know, it's not looking good for their, for, for their point of view. Like I was in a discussion with some Jehovah Witness missionary and uh, I said, so what's the deal with your only 144,000 people get saved in the kingdom of heaven business? I mean, you're a missionary, isn't that reducing your chances to become you know, saved. She's like, oh, no, hey, we've expanded that. We've got the saved on earth, which are uh, basically unlimited amount of many people. Yeah, as many people as you can fit on the earth that are saved, they're like in category two. She goes, my mom's in category one. I go, so do you get to hang out with her? No, I don't. I go, so like the whole family's thing forever that Mormons believe in, you guys aren't into, huh? Well, yeah, I guess not, but, uh, you know, I'm still going to be in, like, the earth heaven. Isn't that cool? Well, I don't know. That's, uh, that's pretty bad if you can't be with the people you love most. So, she kind of shut down there. She was trained to shut down. That'd be kind of like shut down, like start burying your testimony and say, Oh, contention, it's all the devil. Even when you're having a peaceful conversation, but you wouldn't do that, would you? Because that's a sign of mind control. Okay. E. Emotional control. Jehovah's Witnesses, they actually tell their people to shun people, including family members, when they become apostates. If they leave the church, you're done. You have betrayed Jehovah. You have betrayed the faith. You are a disease. And you're not part of our family anymore. Okay, so people know that they've got that hanging over them. If they bail the church, you know, they don't have a family anymore. They lost all their friends. They're shunned. Sure, Mormonism did that kind of stuff in the old days, you know, when the Danites were organized and they basically told people to get the heck out of Missouri or they couldn't guarantee their safety or their lives. But they had good reasons for it, really. There was a lot of, you know, mob violence going on and stuff. Sure, Danites contributed to some of that by burning about three towns down, stealing all their stuff and taking it to the bishop's storehouse called milking the Gentiles, but maybe they were just getting back for some of the things those Gentiles did, even if it wasn't the same ones. 
Anyhow, emotional control. Does that happen in Mormonism? Maybe a little. Well, how would that happen? Um, Temple recommend interview. Now, I don't know if I'm par I'll paraphrase, because I, 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 I don't know if I'll get the words right, but something like, do you support or affiliate with anyone or any individual or group whose views are not in harmony with those held by the leadership of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? I used to say, duh, like every day, you know? Like I work with people, I talk with people, I don't like disassociate with everybody that doesn't believe the same things that we believe or sustain, you know, Spencer W. Kimball to be God's one true prophet on the earth, holding all keys of the priesthood and everything else. No. So, you know, I never really had any issues with that, but then I wasn't involved with apostates. You know, people like ex-Mormons for Jesus or something. Back when Ed Decker was doing the Godmakers and they were exaggerating, kind of, you know, the way you say it kind of a thing, saying, God thinks he's just going to be making babies all day with his hundreds of wives to populate these worlds all over the universe. And so he's just a maniac focused on one thing, his one-track mind, or, you know, whatever they said. They kind of exaggerate some things. I mean, they, they had some weird, weird things that they said. Sure, some of it may have been true, but some of things like that were a bit twisted. And they, I, I believe they had some outright lies, too. I'm not really familiar with all the things that they said, but emotional control, does it happen in the LDS church? Like, you're not pressured to go on a mission, are you? Like, you can just, like, blow it off, go to BYU, and be a chick magnet, right? They're not, like, looking for a line in your pants to see if you're wearing garments, are they? You ever heard anything like that? LDS girls aren't told to wait for a missionary. They're not told to tell their boy to go on a mission rather than marry them right when they, you know, get out of high school or something, if that's what they wanted. They're not told that, are they? They're not told that. Missionary boys aren't told that if they serve valiantly, they'll get a prettier girl for a wife, are they? Okay, maybe with Rand Richards and some others said some things like that, but is that really that, you know, it's not that culty, is it? How pressured are the boys to go on a mission? Well, maybe you should ask a boy. Ask one that's gone to church after he's 18 or 19. See if he's getting asked every day in church. So, have you turned in your papers yet? For your mission? I don't know. Do they feel pressured? What happens if they don't go? What happens if they come back early? They lose their testimony. Well, if they become apostates, then they're going to be ostracized. Okay. I guess that's a problem in Utah, especially, if uh, everybody's Mormon. As a matter of fact, I, I did see something where some guy had left the church. He was a doctor, and then the bishop got up and told the congregation, don't go to this guy anymore because he's, he's an apostate. That's what he said. Well, anyway, that's just a story, and I don't even know the guy. So, let's move on. We're getting hung up here a little bit too long. There's some few similarities, but how bad really is it? If we want to know about, you know, mind control techniques, we should probably check out people that are experts on it and read these things, and then we can differentiate. We can see it in the Jehovah's Witnesses, and see how much worse they are than Mormons. I mean, come on. They send the elders to your house and stuff to like spy on you? Okay, we got home teachers and visiting teachers, but they're not as aggressive about that kind of a stuff as, uh, as the J-dubs are. They're, they're, I've just, I've read gnarly stories. Mormons? No, it's pretty mellow. Yeah, you having your prayers? You having family home evening? All right, that's great. That's cool. If you're not, things are screwed up, then they go tell their priesthood leader and it's talked about in word correlation meeting. How do you know about the Smiths? Things are a little rocky. What can we do to help? See, easily pretty helpful. Brother Smith has been reading anti-Mormon material. Well, anyway, let's, uh, let's get, let, let's move on. Sure, there's a little bit of spying, but it's it's not like, you know, the Gestapo or KGB or anything. It's not like the J-Dubs. They, they got it going on a lot worse. Except for that committee that they say they don't have, but they have. 
uh, membership retention committee. Anyway, yeah, that's just like something with the NSA. I wonder why that's just south of Salt Lake. Okay, three. Mormons think the Book of Mormon is more accurate than the Bible, when in fact, it's not even historical, and the Bible is. Oh, you see this all the time from Christians. Hey, Christians, wake up. Just because Jerusalem's there doesn't mean that anything happened there. Just because Bethlehem's there doesn't mean that Jesus was born there. Oh, okay. Well, we don't want to harp too hard. We believe in Jesus, too. Okay. But, you know, I'm just saying. Just because they've got, like, historical stuff and... You know, they got these cities where these stories are told. It doesn't mean that the stories are all accurate. So, I don't think they should be saying that. Yeah, they try to trash the Book of Mormon. Why? Because it says there were chariots and horses and elephants and honeybees and, you know, flocks of herds of sheep and goat. Well, okay. We couldn't really find him. Where I wasn't even here when Columbus got here. Maybe they didn't look hard enough for horses. Maybe the Lamanites got hungry in a, you know, in a famine and ate all the elephants. Maybe the honeybees got a special disease and died. And maybe the Lamanites picked up all the steel swords from the Nephites at the Battle of Cumorah and melted them down in their steel factories and then just trashed their steel factories and you know, recycled it or something. I don't know. We can't find any evidence, but that doesn't mean it's not true. What about the DNA thing? Hey, you know, what's the deal? The Lamanites, they're Hebrews, right? They just disappeared into a huge population that came here before Adam and survived Noah's flood. That explains it perfectly, right? I mean, that's why 99.4% of the Native Americans tested showed that they were from Siberia and apparently came over like 13,000 years ago on an ice bridge after an ice age, like thousands of year before, years before Adam and Eve took, you know, started, started wearing fig leaves and stuff and, and then got their original garments made of coats of skins when Jesus brought the first death into the world by killing some animal to make them garments with. I mean, are you serious? I don't know. I guess we better leave that one. Let's put that one on the shelf. We'll figure it out in the millennium because it destroys the whole book of Genesis narrative and Mormonism actually believes that that's true. That, you know, the earth was made. And we, a, we don't know what periods, but there was no death in the world until Adam fell. So we shouldn't have any fossils, uh, for, you know, pre-6,000 years ago. And we shouldn't have any American Indians coming over from Siberia 13,000 years ago. And they sure as hell would have been washed away in Noah's, in Noah's flood, because we know that happened, right? We do, don't we? I mean, Christians have figured out how many elephants and stuff you can fit on Noah's Ark and all the other animals. And we know that there have been, you know, floods all over the place. I guess the problem is when you look at, you know, like records of kings and real estate deals and wars and stuff like in Egypt and Sumer and Babylon and various city-states that existed in the Middle East, along with the fact that we've got these people that came from Siberia, apparently, according to their DNA. All these records went right through the flood period. They weren't washed away with Noah's flood, apparently. But you know what? Probably the devil just made those art things up and then, like, made them look older or something. Right? It's got to be it got to be an answer. We'll get it in the millennium, right? Okay, I'm going to shut down rational thought. This is getting difficult. Let's move on. Book of Mormon. I, I guess there are a few more things. They say it's full of contradiction. They say it's got mistakes, you know, from the King James Bible that the Smiths had in it. They say it's got stuff from Isaiah that was written by the second author of Isaiah after they left Jerusalem. They say it's got stuff about Jeremiah, which happened after they left the Jerusalem area. Hey, they had seer stones in the Book of Mormon too, you know? It's in like Alma, okay? As a matter of fact, they got the magic spectacles in Ether, like chapter three and maybe chapter 12. So they could have been like magically knowing these things. They didn't have to be in Jerusalem, come on. 
All right. But the one thing that is kind of tough is the fact that Joseph Smith said that the Catholic Church, a great and abominable church, the devil screwed up the Bible, put a bunch of phony baloney stuff in it, changed some stuff. So God wanted him to fix up the Bible. So we did some Joseph Smith translation stuff on it. And so the problem that some people point out is that, you know, screwed up stuff from the Catholic Bible got into the Book of Mormon because Joseph Smith actually retranslated certain verses in the Bible. And those verses in their corrupted form actually were in the Book of Mormon. Okay, I'll put that one on the shelf. Jesus will tell us in the millennium. Unless I get a seer stone and I can have that revealed to me. Of course, we're supposed to get those seer stones uh, about the time of the resurrection or the, millenn the millennium, I think, right? Aren't we? That's what it says in section, is it 130 or is it 77? I think it's 130. Yeah, everybody gets their own seer stone. So seer stones were a magic deal. Joseph Smith had one. He used his was brown. Well, now they're going to be clear like crystal balls. So that'll be cool. Sure, we got them in the Book of Mormon. And then they came out of the story into Joseph Smith's life. Before he ever had the Book of Mormon. So it's just kind of preparatory. He was preparing by being a magician with his seer stone that he was using in the treasure hunting business with his dad. That's how he met his wife. So, you know, it all worked out. He wasn't into the sea. If he wasn't a seer, being the guy hired to, you know, find the hidden treasures for the pirate treasures or whatever they're looking for, the mines from the, you know, Spaniards or whatever, he wouldn't have met his wife. So, you see, it's a good thing. All right. We better move on here. Book of Mormon. Don't worry about the contradictions. We'll figure it out in the millennium. So Jacob spoke a little French and said, Brethren, adieu, ending the book of Jacob, you know? So that they so they said Jesus Christ, 2200 BC, before Greek was invented. So they were talking about, you know, New Testament arguments before the New Testament happened. So they were quoting guys like Peter and Paul and John before they ever lived, supposedly, you know, in, in older texts of the Book of Mormon. Maybe they saw it on a seer stone and, and saw these conversations and said, I'm going to talk like these guys. I don't know. Do you know? <sighs> okay. I, I, there's tons of stuff about the Book of Mormon. No, it isn't just a copy of the view of the Hebrews or the, you know, Book of Napoleon or the the, 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 the late war. Sure, they've got similar content. Sure, just like the view of the Hebrews, it explains the presence of the American Indians not being, you know, like people that came over around the Ice Age, which would prove Genesis wrong. It tells us they came from Jerusalem. They just got turned black because blackish, dark, you know, it says a skin of blackness, but they're, don't we call them the red man? They got cursed, it says, 2 Nephi chapter 5, cursed because of their wickedness and rebellion. So God turned them like that so they didn't look like whatever Jews are supposed to look like, which is evidently white, according to the Book of Mormon. And delights them, I might add. It explained that. And so what if it's in the view of the Hebrews? And so what if it was recently published at the time? And so what if the author was Oliver Cowdery's pastor at his church? It doesn't mean he got that information that resembles it from it, does it? Just coincidence. Learn to live with coincidences. Learn to live with the fact that there's multiple names in the Book of Mormon that just seem to be really similar to locations near where Joseph Smith lived. It's a coincidence, I'm telling you. Blow it off. Put it on the shelf. Reinforce your shelf. All right, we got to move on. Next. Where's number four? Good grief, I'm gonna have to find it. How did I do this? Oh, here we go. Four. Joseph Smith was a false prophet. He gave false prophecies and added on to the Bible, which is forbidden in the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Revelations. Hey, guess what? We had this book called Missionary Pal, you know, that like missionaries had. Points out like super obvious stuff. Here's one that points out, hey Christians, newsflash, Deuteronomy is like at the beginning of the Bible, like the fourth or fifth book, okay? So, um, check this out. 
Everything after that is added on. And the Bible wasn't even a book, it's a library. That's what like Bible means. Bible, biblioteca, you know, learn some Latin, okay? It's not even a thing. It means who screws up, who, who, who messes with the book of Deuteronomy or who messes with the book of Revelation. God authorized Joseph Smith to do that, so don't be messing with him. All right, false prophet. Hey, you want to talk about false prophecies? Look at Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, they predicted like the end of the world, like what, three, four, five times? And they're still going. Joseph Smith, he made some references like, you know, 56 years should wind it up, or if I lived and I'm 80 something, you know, I'd see the Son of Man or whatever. I thought he already did. I don't know. Anyway, no big deal. I guess probably the biggest one that's a hassle is when. Joseph Smith prophesied that Hiram Page, you know, the guy with the seer stone that started getting revelations for the whole church, and then Joseph said only his rock was for the whole church. <clears throat> it's in the Doctrine and Covenants, actually. Um, he told Hiram Smith, and is it Oliver Cowdery? He said, I prophesy that if you go to Salem, no, not Salem, Massachusetts, that was another gig, find treasure. They had money problems, okay? I guess they couldn't get in the treasure cave where all the golden plates were. And the hill Kimura that Brigham Young and Oliver Cowdery talk about. So anyway, he said, you go to Canada and you can sell the copyrights to the Book of Mormon. Yeah, it's, it's what? It's uh, the keystone to our religion. But these guys are Canucks and we need money. Sell them the copyrights there. I don't know how they're going to manage it. He said, you know, I prophesy you'll, you'll manage to do it and you'll bring back a lot of money. So... That's a big problem because they failed and they came back. But he explained it. He said, listen, some revelations come from God, some come from men, and some come from the devil. I guess I just screwed up this time. That last sentence I kind of added in is just kind of the obvious. I, I, you know, maybe he said that. I don't know. But he did say the first part, apparently. And uh, I don't know. Even prophets uh, get deceived sometimes, I guess, right? Is that what that's saying? Doesn't go too well with, uh, you know, <clears throat> by, 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 whether by my own voice or the voice of my servants is the same, Doctrine and Covenant section 1. And it doesn't go so well with, uh, I think it's uh, DNC 21, where it says, Thou shalt give heed unto all his words as if from mine own mouth. But we'll throw it on the shelf. Maybe we can reinforce it. Head down to Home Depot. Okay. <clears throat> False prophet. Good grief, the guy was awesome. All right, so anyway, we uh, decided to take a break there. That was the end of part one. Hit subscribe, comment, do some likes maybe, and uh, get to section two, you know, part two as soon as you can. It's uh, a lot of good information. Been a Mormon Truth video, thanks.